Okay, so uh, solar cell is also called a photovoltaic cell. Why is it called a photovoltaic cell? Photovoltaic. It generates a? Okay, so it generates, so when I shine light, a potential difference appears across a PN junction. Right? Okay. All right. So let's look at it here. Have people seen a diagram like this for solar cell? Hmm? What does it show you? It shows you the solar spectrum, uh, which uh, which is incident on the Earth. This yellow one that you see here is the sunlight at the top of the atmosphere, right? And now, as the light goes through the atmosphere, what happens? It gets absorbed. Part of it gets absorbed by you see this water vapor. You have carbon dioxide. All these things absorb. Uh, uh, radiation and the red one that you see here is the radiation which reaches the earth's surface. The red one here. Okay. And you see that radiation, where is it mostly? It's in the, in the ultraviolet side is fairly small. A lot of it is in the visible region and quite a bit of it in the infrared region. Right. So that's how it is distributed here. Okay, this is the solar radiation which is incident and this is the radiation which we would like to harness uh, for uh, generation of electricity using a solar cell, right? How much radiation is available on Earth's surface? Well, it depends on, you know, uh, at what angle the sunlight is uh, arriving and this is a standard that people use which is what is called as AM 1.5. AM 1.5 is, you can see here, it's arriving at an angle of 48.2. And so what is AM? AM refers to air mass. So AM0 is what? It is the intensity of uh, radiation outside the Earth's atmosphere. So it's not gone through any air, any amount of atmosphere here. Yeah? So we call it AM0. And how much is the total uh, intensity? 1367 watts per meter square. Now, if it goes vertically through, right, vertically through, then we call it air mass. 1.0 here and radiation that reaches the earth surface is 925 watts per meter square. If it goes at this particular angle, it, you can see here it will go through more of the air mass, right? And we call it AM 1.5, which is 844 watts per meter square. If it goes at a even greater angle here, it passes through more of air mass, more gets absorbed. So you get less here, 691 watts per meter square. So there's a certain amount of, and most of the solar cells are characterized under AM 1.5 radius. So AM 1.5, 844 watts per meter square. That's the amount of radiation that is available uh, per meter square. Here. Okay, that's the amount. So 84.4 milliwatt per centimeter square. Right. So if you make one centimeter square, take one centimeter square area, 84.4 milliwatts of power is available. Okay, and this power is distributed in this in this red diagram that you see here. That's how it is distributed. Okay, all right. Solar cell basic thing is uh, what happens is you have a sun here, smiling sun. The photon comes in, right? The photon comes in. What happens if if the material has been chosen of the proper wavelength? The photon generates electron hole pair. And this is my solar cell here. It has two electrodes, anode and cathode. This goes here towards the anode. This goes towards the cathode here. Now, who drives it towards the anode and cathode? Hmm? Really? Electric field in the junction drives it. Okay. All right. And then if you connect a wire and a bulb, the bulb, of course, if you have enough of them, the bulb will light up. Right? Okay. So that's the behavior here. But solar cell is a diode. The most common solar cell, in fact, all solar cells are diodes. Uh, this is the diode that we just saw. You apply a voltage here and a current flows through the diode here. And this is the characteristics, right? Forward bias. Forward bias here. And I'm not showing the reverse bias. There's a small current here in the reverse bias. When you take the same solar cell, the same PN junction, illuminated with light, then the characteristics of my PN junction, note that I, I have no longer applied any voltage, right? In fact, I've connected a load. The characteristics becomes like this. Here. The characteristics is of this kind. 
okay when i shine light on my p n junction i don't apply any voltage here i don't apply i connect a load so the p n junction becomes a source of current note that i is negative so what is happening is the p n junction is driving current into the load here and as it drives current into the load depending on rl i will have a certain voltage which will appear over here so this is how my p n junction is, has become under light is become a source of current here source of voltage and source of current here so it's acting almost like this here right if you have, if you had a battery and you connect an rl the battery would drive the current into rl like this this is what a p n junction will do because we just said i is negative here so a voltage is developed because of the incident light and that voltage is driving current into my load okay so this is the signature here this is the, this is the place where my pn junction is acting as a source of power as a source of power here why because is drive is driving current into the load okay so it's generating power here in this part and this is the characteristic that you see here it's as if you know the forward bias characteristic that you see here has been displaced down by a certain amount here and then it goes like this okay what we would like to understand is that when i shine light we would like to get this characteristic that you see here this is the solar cell characteristics we would like to get this one and of course if i look at this particular diagram uh, you know we call it the short circuit current which is appropriate because if i take this and short it then the voltage is zero and a certain amount of current would flow the injunction would drive a certain current which is the isc short circuit current and if i open it here make rl equal to infinity no current really goes and you get a open circuit voltage right so there's a difference between a pn junction under light and a battery battery would have been what would the battery have done battery would have huh? not constant current battery would have maintained the voltage to be constant the battery would have been no matter how much current you draw the battery would have been a vertical line right same voltage would have been there across it whether the current i is zero or current is 10 milliampers 20 milliampers the voltage would have been the same so this is not a like, perfect battery as you can see here the voltage is fairly high uh, across the pn junction but when you are not drawing any current the moment you start to draw current the voltage of a pn junction falls the voltage of a pn junction falls here as you draw more and more current eventually the voltage will go to uh, zero right so it, it's a source of power but it's not a perfect battery that is now as i said we would like to understand this particular uh, we already know this equation of a diode here we would like to get a new equation for a diode but under illumination under the presence of light and what will the, what is the light doing light is generating carriers right light is getting absorbed in my pn junction and generating excess carriers so what is going to happen after voc after voc yes after voc uh, what is really happening is in fact i shouldn't have drawn this here after voc what we have done is we have connected a voltage here a positive voltage here like this here so now in addition to rl i have a positive voltage here. okay so then i will get this part of the characteristic that's a good point i shouldn't have drawn this uh, simply by connecting rl i will not get that part here, right this part i will not get here. so with the voltage here uh, then i will get uh, that part here. all right the simple uh, sim in fact uh, yeah which, one, which one is the current source here so pn junction is act yeah we'll see that pn junction is acting like a, a reasonable current source here you can draw uh, you know a, a current uh, let's say this is uh, we, we'll see the value for a silicon pn junction for a good solar cell this can be uh, close to 40 milliampere per centimeter square so it's 40 milliampere per centimeter square and then you know as you uh, uh, you know a, a, as you change the voltage across this it remains uh 40 milliampers but after a while it starts dropping so here it acts like a reasonable uh sort of a current source yes so you're asking why um, why you are not getting current 
No, I'm not modeling it as a voltage source. I just said that PN junction here is acting like a source of power. It's as if it's like a battery. You know, I'm just showing a battery is a source of power, right? So battery is a source of power and battery drives the current into the load. Something similar is happening here. But I was also pointing out it's not like a battery. A battery would have been a constant voltage. So it's not like a battery. In fact, it, uh, maybe as you rightly said, in this region, it can be modeled better as a current source. Okay, so let's look at that. So a model for a uh, 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 solar cell under light is this one. This is my solar cell under light. It's your usual diode. But in addition to diode, what we have is like a current source. So what the light is doing, light is generating a current, which we, as, as you can see here, is IL, is light generated current. And, and, and so this is, and this is what I want to derive for you, that I can think of PN junction in the presence of light as if it's a usual diode, but in parallel with the current source, in parallel with the current source like this. So now if, uh, if you think of PN junction under light uh, in this particular form, what will be the value of the current I then? This I will be equal to what? How much current will actually go into the load? I will be equal to IL minus the current here. So uh, the diode we know we can model it as in general IS exponent V by NVT minus 1. Can everybody see the diode will be forward biased? This current that you see here is going to flow into the diode. So it's a forward biased diode. And forward bias diode, we can model it like this here. So the actual current which flows into the load is going to be IL, the light generated current, minus ID here. And, and the difference of the two is going to flow into R. Right? And, and so the actual current is going to be IL minus IS exponent V by NVT minus 1. So can you all see now why, what is this part here? Is the normal diode current. And now we've added IL to it. So can you all see is just, is just the diode characteristics, but displaced down. In this case, when I'm plotting it, I'm plotting with I in actually the reverse direction. Okay. So, you know, if I reverse the direction of the current, then I should write it as I equal to IS exponent V and VT minus one minus IL. So it's the usual diode equation, diode current, but displaced down by an amount, which is equal to IL. That's what it is. The whole diode characteristics is just displaced down by an amount I L. Okay, so I should have, if, if I had drawn I in the negative direction, then this would have become minus I L plus I S, and then this would have given me this characteristics. Okay, so that's what a PN junction under light is. A, a usual diode, but with a current source connected here in parallel. Chain. Now, uh, as I said, one can derive some useful solar cell parameters here. If I have I equal to IL minus IS exponent V by NVT minus 1, what will be my short circuit current? Short circuit means voltage is zero. So I equal to basically IL. ISC, short circuit current is nothing but the IL, the photogenerated current. What is my open circuit voltage? How do I calculate? Can I calculate open circuit voltage? What do I do? Put I equal to zero. So you take this, put I equal to zero, and you get open circuit voltage. VOC is NVT LN 1 plus IL by IS. So how do you get, uh, would you want a large ISC, large short circuit current, or not in a solar cell? Obviously, I would like a large short circuit current, correct? And how do you get large short circuit current in a solar cell? Well, generation is fixed because the amount of power, as I said, the sun's radiation is falling. And in one centimeter square area, how much power is falling? 84.4 milliwatt per centimeter square. So that amount of power is fixed, right? And I want a lot of short circuit current. So you want to absorb all the photons, right? So to absorb all the photons, what kind of a material will you choose? Lower band gap material, lower band gap material right? So you want a lower band gap material which will absorb all the photons that are there, right? Uh, is silicon a good material? 
go back and look at the solar cell here. Is silicon a good material to absorb? Look at the radiation here. Where would silicon's wavelength be? Silicon's wavelength here would be where? Uh, silicon is 1.12. So how do you calculate the wavelength? Yeah, but uh, what is the value? So where, where would silicon be? Can you see that silicon, is, you know, it would absorb all this visible ultraviolet, all this region here, it would tend to absorb, right? But it would miss out also this part here. All these regions that you see here, it will miss out. So higher band gap materials are not good. Why? Because they would miss out on more of this particular region here. Lower band gap materials is what we want, right? Okay, fine. So let's go back here. Would you want a higher open circuit voltage? Would that matter? Higher open circuit voltage or it doesn't matter? Hmm? It, it also matters? Okay. How large an open circuit voltage? Uh, what, what is that determined by? N ideality factor of a diode is sort of fixed. You can't do much. VT is thermal voltage. IL is for a given intensity. Let's say IL is fixed. How do you get a large open circuit voltage? By making IS small, right? IS small. How do you make IS small? You get, we have just gone through PN junction and we saw reverse saturation current. What does IS depend on? What are the terms? NI square, right? How do you make NI square small? Large band gap, right? So now you end up in the problem. This says you make small band gap material to get large IISC, and this says make large band gap material to make VOC. So now, what can you guess? With a, will a very small band gap material like uh, germanium be very good as a solar cell, or will a large band gap material like you know with a band gap of two eV or two point five eV be very good? Are you saying that? There will be probably a band gap which is perhaps optimal. Very large band gap will give you very nice VOC, right? But will not absorb much light. So ISC is going to be very small. Very small band gap will absorb a lot of photons, will give you large ISC, but will not give you large VOC. So that, that's also bad. So in between, probably I have a band gap which is perhaps optimal. Right. So we'll not go into the details of that, but you can already see. But how much, what is the maximum power that I can extract from my solar cell? Suppose I give you ISC and I give you VOC. Can you get, uh, if, if I operate my solar cell here, how much power am I drawing? If I operate it here, zero. So how did you say ISC into VOC? Is that the maximum power that I can extract from my solar cell? Where do, where do I operate my solar cell? Somewhere I need to operate, right? Somewhere here, maybe. Uh, and I need to find out what is that point at which I should operate my solar cell to give me the maximum power. How do I find that out? Well, let's do the quick calculation. Maximum load power. So this is my solar cell and this is my current here, I equal to IL. What is the power given to the load here? I into V. So that's the P equal to I into V. That's the power driven into the load. If I plot this, so this is my equation here. If I were to plot power versus voltage, it would look like this. As we just saw. If you bias your solar cell at short circuit point, power is zero. If you bias it at VOC point, power is again zero. Somewhere it reaches a maximum power. Right? And it's very easy to calculate. P equal to I into V here. What will you do? Take derivative del P by del V equal to zero and you will find a place where you will find a value Vm. That's, this gives you the maximum power point. So you will bias it here and how much is the maximum power that you will get? Im into Vm. Whatever that value is. So we, we actually have to take this equation, take its derivative and find out where this particular point is. So Vm is somewhere in between zero and VOC. Right? So P max is Im into Vm. 
Now, what people do is the following. Maximum power that I can get is IM into VM. What they do is they take IM into VM, divided by ISC into VOC, multiplied by ISC into VOC. Okay? They do that. Fine? No problem. And this factor, they define it as what, what we call as a fill factor. We'll see in a minute why is it being called as a fill factor here. So, the maximum power that you can draw from your solar cell is what? Fill factor into ISC into VOC. When you guys said that the maximum power is ISC into VOC, in a way you were saying fill factor is 1. Fill factor is never 1. It's always less than 1 here, right? So, what is this fill factor? So, maximum power that you can, we'll just see in a minute, maximum power that you can draw from your solar cell is this one. Fill factor, ISC into VOC. Maximum efficiency of the solar cell then is power that the solar cell can generate divided by the power that is falling over it multiplied by 100. And how much power? You know, 84.4 milliwatt per centimeter square. Many times people characterize it at a little higher, which is 100 milliwatt per centimeter square. So the, a, a condition under which we frequently evaluate our solar cell is we assume that the radiation is AM 1.5. And the power that is falling is 100 milliwatt per centimeter. And then we calculate how much power can my solar cell uh, give, which is a product of these two factors, these three factors. Okay. Now, why is it being called a fill factor here? Okay. So this is what we said is a fill factor. Now, look at this particular diagram. Here. We said somewhere is this maximum power point, Vm and Im. How much power uh, is being drawn uh, is IM into VM, which is this rectangle. And uh, what is this ISC into VOC? Can you see that bigger rectangle? ISC into VOC. So this is ISC into VOC. And this is the actual power that you can get IM into VM. So what, what does the ratio indicate? This smaller rectangle, how much is it able to fill the bigger rectangle? Right? The smaller rectangle, IM into VM, what fraction does it fill of the bigger rectangle, which is ISC into VOC? So that's why it's called the fill factor. Okay. How do I get fill factor equal to 1? What do you want this shape to look like? Rectangle. But we are not going to get rectangle. Why? Because this is, what is the shape actually? Exponential. It is exponential. So you're not going to get a rectangle. So you'll, you're never going to get fill factor equal to 1. But exponential, remember, exponential is also a very sharp curve. And therefore, you get fairly close. You get a value which is, this is the perfect one. So you get fairly close. You can approach something like 0.85. This value can become as high as 0.85. Beyond that, beyond 0 0.85, 0 0.89, you can't go. You can't go beyond that. Because you can't get a perfect rectangle. Okay? That's not possible here. So, this is a summary of the solar cell here. Short circuit current, open circuit voltage, and the fill factor here. And the fill factor is determined by what? Determined by the shape here. Right? Shape here. Ideal shape is a rectangular, but this is what we end up getting. Okay? So, fill factor depends on the shape here. These are the things that you can keep in mind regarding a solar cell here. This is uh, this term is like an ideal silicon solar cell. If you do everything properly, you absorb all the photons that silicon is capable of absorbing, and you design your solar cell very well, you may approach an ideal silicon solar cell may give you an efficiency of 29%. Ideal silicon solar cell, 29%. People have not uh, uh, gotten close to 29%. You can see a uh, 25 or so is where they have reached. 25, 26 maybe. I, I don't know the latest here. Probably close to 25%. But even an ideal silicon solar cell can only give you 29% efficiency. Which means what? If you if you take 29 is roughly one third. Right? Two thirds of the power is wasted. Two thirds is wasted. One is not able to absorb. And silicon solar cells are the most efficient solar cells that are there in the market at least in the commercial uh, space here, okay? With some, uh, you know, with some 3-5 materials 
uh, and, and using multiple solar cells, people have approached close to 50, 50 percent efficiency. But even then, so some of the highest efficiency solar cells which are used in satellites and other places are close to 50 percent. But even then, 50 percent of the power you're losing, 50 percent only. The commercial ones that you may find, this one, oh, we have a solar cell <laughs> panel right here. This one is likely to be maybe 17 percent or so. 17, 18 percent solar cell. Okay. So now where is, uh, so a lot of power is, is getting lost. Where is it getting lost? For example, you see this number here, 43. If silicon were to absorb all the photons that were incident on it, this number would have been probably close to 70 or so, 72 or 73. But silicon is not able to absorb all the photons because it has a bad gap of 1.12. It's missing a lot of photons, photons of lower energy. Okay, so there, there is a loss here. There is a loss here. There is a loss in fill factor because fill factor, remember, we wanted it to be 1 and it's only 89 here. So you can see here, 11% loss is right here. 11%, even if I, if these were perfect numbers, 11% loss is right here. So you have losses at every places and, if, and, and, and so it's not very efficient as you can see here, solar cells here. All right. Okay. So now back to our uh, physics here. What we want to do is we want to determine and show that a PN junction under light is this expression. Okay. This expression is, is how a PN junction behaves under light. Here. All right. So this is where we start. I want to show you that the, when I have a PN junction and I shine light over it, what does that light do? It generates carriers. And I'm, I'm going to assume something simple. I'm going to assume that the carriers are generated uniformly everywhere. Now you can imagine that it's not going to be generated uniformly, right? Say the light is incident from here. As the light goes in, where is the intensity highest? Here. And so maximum generation will be here. As it goes further and further, is getting absorbed. So the light is getting weaker. So intensity is becoming less and less and less. So maximum generation may take place here. And as you go, generation will keep on decreasing. Right? So in general, the generation is non-uniform. Okay? And so one has to do uh, uh, more uh, uh, realistic analysis. But in this case, what I'm doing is I'm take, assuming that the generation is uniform everywhere. How much is the generation rate? GOP. And what I will show you is that under this uniform generation rate, my current in a PN junction is this usual current that we have derived plus this component. Okay. Plus means actually a negative component. So under a uniform illumination, which causes a generation rate of GOP per centimeter cube per second my current in a PN junction will become this term. I will show you in a, it's just a, a you know, uh, two, three, two, three slides uh, worth of derivation. Okay. So we'll show you that. If this equation is true, can you see that this equivalent circuit is true? Current is made up of what? Two parts. The first part, two parts means two parallel parts. Current is made up of two components here. This is one component and this is the other component. This component is okay, a usual diode equation. And this component is, I've represented by a current source. Why current source? First of all, the direction of the current source, is it fine? Because of negative is pointing up. And why a current source? Can you see that there's no voltage dependence? This component of current is not dependent on voltage. There's no voltage dependence here. And how do I represent it in the form of a circuit? A current which is independent of voltage, a current source. So that's how it ends up with a current. So you can see that if I prove to you that this is the equation which is valid, then my silicon under illumination can be modeled in this form. And this is what I've been using. This model I've been using to show you the characteristics of solar cell. So let's go and show this one. Here. Okay. Now note, we said that current in a PN junction is made up of two components. It remains valid. It's made up of a minority carrier component here, JPXN and JN minus XP. This current and this current here. I'm still going to assume that 
within the depletion region, depletion region is very narrow and generation recombination is negligible here. Okay, within this region. Here. So that's why, the, uh, you know, I've not taken into account generation recombination here. So it's made up of JPXN and JN minus XP. We've already shown you that this minority carrier currents, JPXN, that you see here, JPXN, is diffusive, minus QDP, del P by del X. And similarly, this is also QDP, del N by del X. Okay, this we agree. All right. This picture you've also seen. It tells you what is the excess minority carrier density here and what is the excess minority carrier density. Here. What is it determined by? The arguments that we use that EFN is constant th throughout here, EFP is constant here. These arguments are still valid. And what does it tell us that the excess carrier density at Xn is how much? Ni square or Nd exponent Qv by Kt minus 1. is the voltage which decides how much is the excess carrier density here. And similarly, what is the excess carrier density here? Ni square over Na exponent Qv by Kt minus 1. So remember, we know the excess carrier density here. We know the excess carrier density at the edges. Keep that. Yes. Let it be. No. No, th th this one, see, all that we said is EFN is here, constant, and EFP is here. Now, EFN here, uh, EFP, let's say here, where does it coincide with? Who determines this? The voltage applied. And EFN here, who determines? So, on the N side, the voltage is zero. So, EFN is determined by zero voltage here. And on the P side, what? who decides EFP? The voltage applied. So, the position of EF and EF, EFN is decided by the voltage applied. And EFP remains constant till here. Which one? Yeah, we will. No, and if you don't apply any voltage, yes, obviously. If you don't apply any voltage and no light is incident on it, obviously, PN junction, there will be zero voltage across the PN junction. Right? So this picture is still valid here. At Xn, I still have Ni square over Nd here. And at this point here, it's still. That's the point that I wanted to emphasize here. The position of EFP is determined by voltage. The position of EFN is determined by voltage. The voltage, the contacts decide where my Fermi levels are. Okay. And then there's, you know, they remain flat here and they remain flat here. So these two boundary conditions still remain the same. Now let's come back to continuity equation. That's where the changes are. This is the full blown continuity equation. Now what I've written is GP generation. Earlier was due to what? Due to thermal generation. Now add it, thermal plus due to optical. Minus recombination, usual recombination. Okay? So continuity equation in the presence of light, what I do is I just add an additional generation term. Now remember we are doing steady state calculation, current in steady state, so we put del P by del T is zero. We put that. This term remains as it is. G thermal minus recombination we've already shown using Shockley Hallery is can be written as minus del P by tau P. So this minus RP is del P by tau P we've already shown. So we keep it as it is. And GOP is here. So my continuity equation changes earlier, remember, was minus 1 by Q del J P by del X minus del P by tau P. Now I have an additional generation term, so we add that GOP. So this is my uh, uh, continuity equation here. So I need to solve current JP. I'm, now I'm trying to determine if you go back, I'm trying to determine uh, this current here in the end region. Here. So current is diffusive. Okay. Current is diffusive. So JP I write as a diffusion current. It becomes DP del square del P and del X square equal to del P and by tau P minus GOP. That's the equation that I get. Okay. This equation we can write it as uh, dp, I can take it here, dp tau p is lp square minus gop by dp here, lp standard definition. Now this equation, if I solve, in general it is made up of three terms. A exponent minus negative exponential, positive exponential, plus now this additional term here because of gop. Okay, fine. This positive exponential, what will happen to it? The this predicts that carrier density keeps on going as x tends to infinity. B must be equal to 0. So this then turns out to be A exponent minus x minus x in LP plus GOP term. 
what is the boundary condition that I should put now? At x equal to xn, what do I have? Ni square over Nd exponent qv by kt. So I, I go ahead and put that. Delta p at xn is Ni square over Nd exponent qv by kt minus 1. I put it here. I calculate the value of a. And I substitute here. And it turns out to be here. Delta p in x is Ni square over Nd exponent qv by kt minus 1 minus gop tau p into exponent plus gop tau. That becomes my general expression under the presence of light. If you didn't have light, put equal to zero here, put equal to zero here, you recover your standard expression. Okay, this is delta P in X. Now, how do I calculate the current? Whole current, I take its derivative minus QDP del P by del X. And it comes out to be QDP standard expression here minus QGOP times L. This is on whole current on the N side. Similarly, I'll get electron current on the P side here. So I have this one here. Similarly, I'll get this one here. I'll get minus QGOP into LN. I add, add the two current components, JP, XN, and JN minus XP. And I get the final expression. That my total current is made up of the usual diode equation, uh, the current here, plus or minus this extra component here, QGOP, LP type plus LN. Okay? And, and therefore, my solar cell then under light can be represented by a current source in parallel with a diode in this manner here. These are the two current components. Now, can everybody see why this is uh, QGOP? Does it remind you of something, LP plus LN? Say I apply zero bias, right? I, I put voltage equal to zero. The first term goes zero and I get QGOP LP plus LN. QGOP LP plus LN. Now, when, you, when we looked at reverse bias current, what did we find? Reverse bias current is a generation current, right? And generation outside the depletion region, what did we say? Where does it come from? Effectively, a distance equal to the diffusion length. Why only a diffusion length? Because carriers outside the diffusion length are not able to effectively reach the depletion region edge here, right? So, and so we had here what? Thermal generation. Remember, instead of this GOP, we had thermal generation. Now, what do we have? We have optical generation also, right? So, if I reverse bias it, exponent QV by KT, if I reverse bias it, you can see here, this is the, all this is the thermal generation outside the depletion region. And this is now an additional generation which is due to optical. But then you may be wondering why did I neglect? We saw that generation within the depletion region was very important. Now should I not take generation within the depletion region? But what will you get if you take generation within the depletion region? QGOP multiplied by depletion width. How much is depletion width? 300 nanometer, 400 nanometer, that's the typical number. How much is the diffusion length? 20 micron, 30 micron. So it's 20 micron and 30 micron versus 30 nanometer. Right? And that's why we don't, when I look at this, I don't, because this is GOP, this is constant. Now note that generation, optical generation rate is the same value within the depletion region and same value outside the depletion region. And therefore, because depletion region is very thin, so I forget about it. Because compared to diffusion length, depletion region is very thin. It does not contribute anything. But when it comes to thermal generation, I don't have the same generation rate inside the depletion region and outside the depletion region. Inside the depletion region, thermal generation rate was QNI. It depended only on NI. Outside the depletion region is NI square NB. So I have two different generation, thermal generation rates. Inside the depletion region, Generation rate is very high, very, very high. And that's why that becomes the dominant region. And therefore, I have to, uh, the reverse leakage current in a PN junction is entirely due to generation within the depletion region. Because outside generation rate is much smaller. While here, I have optical generation rate, which is roughly the same everywhere, within the depletion region or outside the depletion region. Then the thickness of the region matters. And that's why it is QGOP LP plus L. That's the total current 
در مدرسه 